on these symposiums, uh, all of which kind of represent some area of, of uh, sustainability in the built environment, where we seem to see a, a growing sense of, of energy and commitment and hopefully consensus growing. So uh, we've talked about, um, we've, we've talked about uh, the state energy strategy in 2012 after that came out because there was so much energy behind that. And I think that's uh, proceeding pretty well at the state level. Uh, we had uh, a session on the Green Construction Code and Green Building Real Estate Valuation. A lot of topics that are really gaining momentum in our community. And this is really helping to push us toward a future that we can all feel good about and uh, that our, our great-grandchildren's grandchildren will, uh, will also be able to enjoy. So that's what sustainability is. Again, I'm with the Northwest Eco Building Guild. We're an alliance of architects and contractors, builders, as well as realtors and uh, green building material suppliers. We work together to transform the built environment through uh, education. Let's see, I'm, what, this is not my proper slideshow. What's going on here? Oh, okay, I guess it didn't sort the way I thought it Oh, it's okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. So let's. Um, so we. So like I said, we work on the built environment. It's not just homes and buildings. It's also schools, but it's beyond that to the site of each building, the sustainability of the site, the neighborhoods, the whole community as a whole, and and for our whole planet, uh, because the built environment affects every aspect of our life. Um, I would like to, uh, first off, start by thanking our host, uh, the South Puget Sound Community College. Penny, would you like to join me here for a second? Um, we had our first Vision to Action Symposium here uh, in April or March of 2012. It was on the State Energy Strategies. It was such a great building that we wanted to come back. And so um, it is a LEED Platinum building and uh, LEED Gold. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you probably deserve it. It's just such a cool building. I mean, just for the artistic aspect of it. Um, this is Penny Cole. She's a, a well. I think you're the facilities manager, director for the Fred College. Thank you for having us. 
And thank you all for coming. We're really proud of this building. Uh, we opened this building in late 2009. This was one of the first lead gold buildings in the community college system. Um, the requirement by the state that our, our new buildings be lead silver or better uh, happened, the legislation happened about when we were about three quarters through design. And um, other than doing the documentation for the lead stuff, we had very few changes that we had to make because we were already on the green track, if you will. Um, some of the features uh, that are, I think, really innovative in this building, it is a science building. We do have full featured labs with uh, chemical hoods and all that kind of stuff. And you have all kinds of uh, HVAC requirements and that. But this wing that we're sitting in now, and where we'll have our classes upstairs and all our offices, are 100% naturally ventilated. So there's uh, no mechanical ventilation in this wing of the building. Uh, we do have radiant heat in the floor, so that you don't freeze. <laughs> in the summertime, uh, when, we, when we decided that we were going to do this, we talked with the staff, and they said, well, if it gets too hot in the summer, we'll just take our classes outside. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't know if they really do that or not, but uh, that was one of the discussions we had during design. In the offices themselves, they all have operable windows and, um, and ceiling fans. And so we kind of keep the air circulating in the offices and we encourage them to flush uh, at night. In the, for, air circulation, each office has its own solar-powered um, exhaust fan, which, which helps keep the air moving, which I thought was really innovative. On the, on the roof of this building, we have a small um, solar array, which was kind of a added thing. At, actually, we put it on after the building was built. We had to run all the infrastructure down. And we do sell power back to PSE. Um, the labs are all, like I said, they're, I'll call it highly mechanical, because there's a lot of stuff, a lot of air requirements that you have to do with a lab. But daylighting was one of the things that we really uh, emphasized when we were building this building. And you'll notice in the labs, they have high soaring windows and um, it really keeps the rooms nice and bright and not, not much need for, for artificial light. Uh, one of the concerns when we were building was on the, this side, I can remember, okay, so the south side, um, is that the high windows would not allow, even with shades, to get it dark enough for presentations. And so on the upper windows, and I, kind of glance through the windows to see if you can see it. But we have a special glass that we put in there that has, um, throughout, in between, it has little reeds that actually take the light and bounce it off a soffit um, to bounce light back into the room. Uh, and it also reduces the glare. So that was another really thing, really good thing that we did. Uh, Lots of recycled materials. Um, the, it, the landscaping has no permanent irrigation. Our retention pond out there, you can see, is very naturalized. Um, and it's growing just the way it was supposed to, like, it's, um, like it would out in nature. Uh, the Japanese maples are part of our uh, world-class maple collection. They also have no irrigation with them, which is and they're doing splendid, as you can see. Um, what else did we do? Uh, well, people get to, I guess we can have folks walk around. Oh yeah, yeah. please do. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's that's about where we are here. We have two other lead buildings, lead gold buildings on campus, and the building we have under construction now will be lead gold as well. Now, aren't you also um, planning a new building in Lacey? 
Yes, we are. We have purchased the what is known as a row six property over on Sixth <coughs> Avenue, and um, we're just in the process of figuring out exactly what programs will go in there. But it will be <coughs> that whole campus, which very much looks like this campus, will be very green as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So, yeah. all right. Thank you so much, Penny. <laughs> Um, just really quickly, uh, some logistics. Uh, as you can see, we've got this this room as our lecture hall, and then um, when we break for the cafe, the World Cafe breakouts, those are going to be up on the second and third floor. There's and also on the landing. So as you go up, you'll see that there's different tables that are wrapped with paper. Each one has a letter, and the letter uh, that is uh, on that table is also there is, corresponds to a letter on your name tag. So there's two breakout rounds. Uh, C1 stands for Cafe Round 1, and the letter that's after C1, after the colon there on your name tag, uh, indicates the, the cafe group that you should, that you're assigned to, and that's, a, that's intended to help kind of get a good mix of people at each table and have a balance of numbers at each table. There's a, several people who checked in, who walked in and weren't pre-registered. If you just, you know, pick one, uh, you know, and that'll be fine. It, it's, it's not a rigid system. You don't have to go to the table, but, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's intended to kind of help facilitate this being a, the most productive conversation we can. And um, at each table, there'll be a, a kind of a host who's going to explain things, and those folks can also help you find your way if you get a little lost. Um, and if you get a little lost or inspired in a different way, to go to a different table, that's, that's not a big deal, like I'm saying. So there's also, as you can see, the food and the restrooms are outside this room and around the right-hand side to the, uh, to the side hallway there, and it's the same on each floor. So, um, I want to just take a moment to say thank you to some of the organizations that helped this symposium and previous symposiums uh, be successful. Uh, first off, just a huge thanks to the Thurston Regional Planning Council and the work that they've been doing on the Sustainable Thurston Plan. TRPC has been a, a major co-sponsor of the last three of our symposiums and, they just, and we've been uh, participating, a lot of our members have been participating in the Sustainable Thurston Plan process. Um, which, which is really kind of tied, we're seeing the, the, the parallel tracks of what we're trying to do and what they're trying to do and, um, you know, what we're trying to do as a community. So it's really, thank you to TRPC for helping with this. Um, we're really following the Urban Corridors Task Force Group uh, work too as well. Um, also, Thurston County, which actually was the, the solid waste program, was the original source of funding for our, um, for our symposium and uh, have continued to be supportive of that. Um, they have some great programs on their website, uh, and we're working toward a plastic bag ban, I understand. It's already been passed in a couple of different jurisdictions. Thank you, Ms. Thurston Solid Waste. Oh, plastic bag ban will be good for these guys. Uh, thank you to the City of Olympia that is sponsoring this one, and the next uh, round of three more that will follow. Um, we have uh, great partners with the city, and they're working really hard right now to adopt their new comprehensive plan and to move forward on a lot of different areas that will empower our whole community to move forward and create a, a regional downtown that's that's worthy of our whole state. So I appreciate that. Oh, there is a good picture. Right? We've got some real assets now. I noticed in this picture, I, I just stole this off the internet, but there's some things missing here. There's a Instead of a building, there's a park or two here. That's interesting. Hmm. I'm not sure where that picture came from. Uh, the City of Tom Water is also a sponsor for this one and uh, the next one that's coming up. And uh, they've got two really great uh, district planning processes that I've been participating, luckily, in uh, the brewery district planning process. Um, if any of you all have been involved in those, they're so empowering and really exemplify what I'd like to see in sub-area planning going on around our community. So thank you to the City of Tumwater. Um, of course, we're really excited that the uh, brewery may, may get a new, uh, a new life here soon. Thurston County Chamber uh, kicked in for this one and has been a, a good partner, especially their green business program. Um, that's a good thing. And the Thurston County Association of Realtors is here today and um, is also a sponsor. Thank you to both of those organizations. Olympia Federal Savings has been a partner with the Northwest Eco Building Guild for a very long time and uh, to a lot of other organizations in our community, so I really appreciate 
uh, their participation and support. Now Barbara wasn't able, or Whitlow uh, wasn't able to come today because she basically goes to everything and she needed to off. So, so that's that. So I want to I want to take a moment now to let's talk and let's find out who's here a little bit. Um, if you are an elected official, would you please raise your hand? I'm not going to take time to individually acknowledge you, but um, please go up and meet these folks afterward. I really appreciate you being here, and um, you're just a, uh, providing some great leadership in our community. Um, I'll just get my other slide show here. Make sure put these together. There we go. Um, uh, there are some in the room. How many of you would consider yourself like a planner, or uh, you know, that's that's kind of the, the planning community, or on the planning commission, perhaps? Um, a lot of those folks, okay, just kind of have everyone get a sense of who all's here. Now, do we have any architects in the room? Got a handful of architects, excellent. Those are people who we want to know because they're going to help us shape our community in the future. How about builders, developers, folks who actually put uh, materials together on uh, in buildings? Oh, there's Doug, and, yeah, oh, we missed a few people there, they were planning to come. How about realtors or real estate agents and brokers and folks involved with realty? Excellent. And um, are you a business owner or in economic development in some way? Okay, let's do this. Ramsey, you should be raising your hand now. He's kind of the economic development <laughs> council representative. And then how about nonprofit groups representing environmental or social, social community issues? Excellent. So, as you can see, we have an incredible mix of people in this room that are going to have a huge influence on the future. And we're looking now at a 20-year future through the Sustainable Thurston Plan, and I'm super excited about that. Now, I think it's going to be sunny today, and you know, you guys can choose to be a lot of different places on a sunny Saturday, but you're here. And I just really appreciate that, and I think it's, it's an incredible opportunity to connect with folks who you might not always have a chance to connect with. I imagine you're here because you sense that something new is possible right now with the things that are going on. Um, I have a lot of hopes for today and I think it's a real moment of opportunity for our community. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of good signs happening right now and there's a lot of change in the air as well. Now that could be a really hopeful thing, it also could be a little scary and um, you know it's, it's uh, difficult sometimes to uh, to uh, get past that. Now, um, I've been working on this sort of building bridges and cross, um, building, building people, bringing people together across uh, different lines for a long time. And in fact, in college, I, I set a goal for myself, or my thesis was kind of to build an economy based on, on love rather than fear. And so it reminded me of, uh, anybody seen the movie Donnie Darko? There was this one scene that was really hilarious and absurd, but She's explaining that you know all of life comes down to two different ways of being. There's either fear or love, and um, and I think in our community sometimes we find ourselves kind of stuck on the left side of this uh, spectrum where there's a lot of conflict and litigation. We get a lot of protests and people are upset, um, and and it, and when that happens, you know not much gets done, and so today is an opportunity to kind of take one giant leap from one side of that continuum to the other side and to try to, you know, try to find the connections that may have divided us in the past, to, to build new relationships and, and to find that common ground that, you know, there, there's a lot, we all share certain values and, you know, there are certain things we disagree on. So and today is really intended to help us focus on the values that we share, uh, find areas of agreement, and yes, acknowledge those areas of disagreement and how we can work to resolve them. But we really want to dwell, instead of on that side, we want to focus on the other side and focus on the, the things that bring us together. So um, I think one of the things that brings us together is the place. You know, I've got these pictures up here of, of all these beautiful things that we have in Thurston County. And I think um, that's, it's pretty clear, I think, more and more that it's that quality of life that is helping our economy stay strong, even in the face of a huge recession that hit our country incredibly hard. We had a relatively resilient um, economy in that, in that situation, and I think it's in large part due to the fact we have such a great quality of life, our air and water are clean, we have open space, and um, you know, that's a, a valuable thing. And I think, I know a lot of you in this room, and I think I, what I know of you, I think you probably all are really wanting to keep it that way and make it better. 
So, um, you know, like I said, um, we've had this kind of situation where we've been locked in a conflicts, conflicts, and so it's time to kind of move past that, and um, it's an opportunity to get unstuck from that pattern. Um, we've got a lot of new leadership, new investments, and it's uh, an opportunity for us to kind of set some of those differences aside and move forward together. So I invite you all as we go forward to roll up your sleeves, uh, reach across the table, meet someone uh, who you might not always get to talk to and engage in a really positive conversation. Um, I was getting on to say the Sustainable Thurston Plan, I think, provides an opportunity, a, really a bridge that um, you know, connects different things together. It connects the idea of compact urban development and protecting our forest, farms, and open space. Really, what we're finding is that if we don't direct growth that's going to be coming, you know, growth may be good or bad, depending on how you look at it, but, um, but the fact is that we're going to have a population growth because of our quality of life. And so if we can direct that growth in a way that uh, allows us to concentrate it into urban areas and protect our forests and farms, um, that's going to be the, the only way we can really achieve any modicum of sustainability. And the Sustainable Thurston Plan really ties these things together and helps us to start a conversation, I think, that will carry us forward. Um, I'm going to move along here quickly. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the World Cafe format. It's, it's a unique format that um, really it's, it's intended to be lively and engaging, evocative. It helps us to link ideas and connect uh, relationships. Um, it's, uh, this is a, it's actually a technology that's spreading rapidly across Europe. A lot of governments and organizations, corporations are using it, and it's really trickling into the United States in a big way. Um, it uses a mind mapping technology, which is kind of what you see here on the screen, is um, using graphic facilitation to uh, you know, connect ideas and um, you know, really be engaging. And it helps us to identify those common values. Maybe the most important thing is it's a new kind of way of public engagement that I think as a, as a community, we really need some new models because we've been you know, practicing public input and we have these public hearings, but they're not really getting a lot of work done. So um, today is really an opportunity to kind of practice some of these new ways of, of relating to each other and getting involved in the process because as we go from the big regional plan to the comp plan down to the sub area plans, these are great opportunities to, um, to get involved and have a real influence, but we have to practice new skills. We have to get a way of uh, engaging between government, the private sector, and citizens, uh, environmental groups, etc. that is going to be more productive than what we've been doing in the past. So this is, a way, this is an opportunity for us to practice and get some new skills, and I encourage you to embrace that. Um, Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about some agreements. Um, I invite you to agree with me on these ideas that uh, for today, our conversation, will practice uh, civility and respect and really uh, welcome all views and, and, and leave space in the conversation for everyone to be heard. Um, focus on what matters and try not to get sidetracked on you know, stories, you know, great, you know, great stories of things that you did when you were a kid or whatever. Let's focus on <laughs> the, the core matter that we're working on and try to link those thoughts and ideas with other ideas that are coming up. Um, sometimes we may need to agree to disagree and really focus on the areas of agreement. If we do, we're gonna, we have in each room an easel with a pad that's, um, normally you call it the parking lot. In this case, we're calling it the bike rack because we're going sustainable. Okay, so so if, if we have ideas, I mean, we're not gonna try to shut up that conversation or gloss over it, we'll, we'll acknowledge it, talk it through a little bit, but then if we need to, we'll put it on the bike rack, we'll agree to meet over coffee downtown or, or up at the new uh, Tumwater Square uh, Brewery District that's going to be just hopping in the next few years. Um, another thing is to get out of your comfort zone. Don't, don't try to stay stuck in your position. Talk from your heart and, and you know, be, make yourself vulnerable to, uh, to hearing what someone else is saying. Listen. Listen intently. Listen with attention and with the intent to find those connections. And finally, the most important thing is really that this model is intended to have the opportunity for real breakthroughs to happen. New ideas, new possibilities that will inspire and excite you and um, hopefully lead to some real new opportunities that we haven't seen before. So with that, a uh, quick review of the agenda. Uh, we're only about 
five minutes behind at this point. Um, uh, ten minutes, maybe, I guess, by the time I'm done with this. The keynote presenter, uh, Rex Burkholder, who's here, um, will break uh, at about 9.55, I'm thinking, for, um, well, not a break, but we'll bring our panel up and they all have some thoughts to share. And then we'll have an open discussion for about an hour um, to, um, you know, to kind of hear from a lot of different perspectives how this green urbanism idea can move forward. Then at 10.45 we'll have a quick break for some refreshing on the coffee and, and food, and then uh, move into our first World Cafe breakout session at 11. Hopefully we can catch up a little time and get there. Um, actually, let me step back to the panel discussion. One of the things we're going to talk about there is what do we stand to gain from green urban density? Uh, what are all the benefits? Who pays for those benefits and who receives them? Um, and then the second, the second real question then becomes the, the first cafe topic is what can we do, do to improve the business case for green urbanism that will help us get there from where we are now and, and get those benefits flowing. Uh, the final cafe topic is what can we agree on? You know, as, as all the things we've talked about, what are the, what's rising to the top of the things that maybe can pull us together and pull us into the future um, and find those big areas of common ground? And then we'll come back at 12.20 for what we call the harvest of ideas. And that'll be really harvesting those agreements and capturing them. It's not a traditional report out where you know, one person gets up and says, this is what we talked about in my group. It's going to be more like a, well, popcorn. Has anybody heard that? You know, people will just, the table hosts that each table will make, may throw out a few ideas at the beginning of the conversation. But then it's really open for everyone to talk about what they heard, what they found inspiring, and and then what, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to capture those ideas for the conversation to, to go forward. Now, on the follow-up side of things, we'll take as much of this information as we can. We'll put it into a report. We'll send it out to all of you. If you gave us permission to release your contact information, we will share your contact information with everybody who's here, but not anybody else. So if you didn't understand that, it's only the people in the room that will get your, your phone number and email and contact information. You might change your mind about whether you said, if you said no, you don't want us to share that. So let the folks at the registration table know that you want us to share your information if you want to stay connected to the folks here. Um, so with that, uh, let me uh, introduce our, our keynote speaker. Rex Burkholder is uh, an urbanist from the city of Portland, or actually the Portland metro region. He's a former counselor of the Portland metro regional government and uh, was the deputy president there. He's also um, trained as a biologist, and he holds a bachelor, holds a, a sciences, worked as a science teacher and in the Northwest Forest. He started a bicycling revolution. Uh, there's a, a, a Rail Evolution is another one, another organization, a, a Bicycle and Transportation Alliance, and formed what's called the Coalition for a Livable Future, which is a broad uh, co uh, coalition of different organizations that, um, you know, from across the, the spectrum, I think, that, you know, I think did, you guys came up with some sort of a regional compact, and I, uh, it was like an agreement among the par parties that, uh, that they could move together towards sustainability. So, um, with that, I want to welcome Rex, and Carol, is, uh, is this all set up for Rex's uh, PowerPoint? Rex is mostly just going to speak, though, but here you go. Great. Thank you for being here. Yes. Okay, I'm the outside expert, so I'm going to tell you how to do everything. So I drove more than 50 miles this morning in Portland. How are you all today? Great, okay, thanks. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'm going to start out, well, actually, because we're a little bit behind, we'll say, let's save the photos, okay, because I have a few photos that, because I didn't do a PowerPoint. I know it's against the rules to not do a PowerPoint. But I was thinking about what could I share with you that would be valuable in the stage that you are in right now. And you have to torture things to make them fit into a PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is start out by telling you a story. Because I think that's where this all begins, is with stories. I, it's going to be my story about how I grew up and what kind of community I grew up in and how that influenced my attitudes and my approach to work. And, what kind of places that I care about and I find that other people care about. And it, it may be kind of a cliche. My childhood sounds kind of like Mayberry RFD or like this fairy tale because it doesn't exist much more in, in this country. Uh, but it is a true story. I grew up in a small capital city in the Midwest. Uh, not on a farm, Mayberry RFD. I didn't do that. But my mom was one of the recent immigrants from the farm. 
The main boulevard to downtown was arched over with big leafy elms, and actually squirrels could go from downtown to our neighborhood 56 blocks out without ever touching the ground. <laughs> Seriously, there was a ravine in our backyard that led to a creek and then down to a river, and as kids, we'd go down there and go swimming in the summertime until the dinner bell rang, and then we would rush home to eat. But basically, my mother said, get the hell out of the house, and I don't want to see you till later. <laughs> you know, we lived on a, a residential street, small lot, modest three-bedroom house, one bath, uh, but with five kids, my dad soon built a shower in the basement so he could get rid of that lineup in the morning, get people out of the house. Uh, the street was full of kids. It was the 1960s. Average family size was 3.5, I believe, at the time. We had five. It was always easy to get up a ball game, that's for sure. My dad did drive to work in our family car, but it was a 10 minute drive from our house on Southwest 56 to the steel mill where he was an engineer. And he'd be home every day by five. Now, isn't that amazing? You know, you work an eight hour day actually in the old days. And that's when dinner would be served. And except for once a month, we found out. He said he had a safety committee meeting, but we found out by finding this black and white photo of him playing pool and he, the stuffed heads of elk and deer that was actually drinking with the guys. <laughs> My mom would feed us breakfast, and then she was off to school or in the summertime out the door to play. And after doing her chores that uh, we kids couldn't do, she would walk down the street to gather the other mothers and drink Kool Aid or coffee. And then she'd come home later in the afternoon after spending a day with her friends and make dinner and get us ready for uh, bed that night. My elementary school was all two doors away from my house. And it was the playground that we used. It's just asphalt and gravel, but we would spend hours and hours there. My junior high school was three blocks away. Senior high was a 10 minute bike ride. Our community was a place that kids could move around independently, any time, any place. There was a park nearby that we would all go in a big group because it was about a mile away. We'd go in a big group there. It had a swimming pool. In the wintertime, we'd go ice skating. And when I got older, there was actually an art museum there which I got really excited about as I got older. We never questioned that fact of independence. Traffic wasn't our problem. Our parents never worried about us leaving the house. We were never alone either. There was always a mother there or a parent at home, but also lots of kids. And we took care of each other and got in trouble together, of course. <laughs> now, nowadays, you hear people talk about the kind of community I lived in and say, well, gosh, that's so dense and crowded and dirty and all those people. And it's sad to hear people think about those kind of communities today as places that aren't positive to live in. Because if you think about in terms of density, I think our housing units per acre are about 10 units per acre. But then you add five or seven people per household. We are a very dense neighborhood. But that dense neighborhood was even denser just on the main street. There's three and four uh, story apartments that line that main street into downtown. But that, those people, what did they do? They supported the schools. They shopped at the grocery stores. There were restaurants nearby. My favorite was Dunkin' Donuts, because when I got done with my morning paper out, I'd go get an apple fritter every day. And then at night, I'd go to McDonald's and get a 15-cent hamburger. You know, and I could do that as a 10-year-old. I could walk down the hill and go to that restaurant. I see some people nodding. Some other people grew up that way, right? Mm -hmm. And then I got, my dad got transferred to Pittsburgh. He worked for a steel company. He went to Pittsburgh. And man, what a town. And at that time, because desegregation was going on, the schools uh, schools were a big issue, and so we settled in a suburb, and in a sub brand new subdivision, that was, all the streets were named after the trees they had just cut down, the Cherry Street and <laughs> Apple <Alabama> Street. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, and then the roads were farm to market roads with no sidewalks, lined with deep ditches, and so you couldn't walk or bike. And I was a bicyclist even back then. It was the second bicycle revolution in this 19, early 1970s. I was the only kid in that new town that rode my bike to school. About half the kids in my high school in Des Moines, Iowa, would ride their bike to school. But in this new place, a suburb of Pittsburgh, you know, it was crazy. I had, was pushed off the road. Someone threw a full beer can at me once. It was like, get out of here. You don't belong if you rode a bicycle. Our social activity center in that town was the 7-Eleven parking lot. There were no parks. There were no gathering places for kids. There were no sidewalks. To see your friends, if you didn't drive, you had to have your parents chauffeur you. My mother went from her independent lifestyle of hanging out with the girls to being our chauffeur and taking my family. You know, think of five kids, right? My older brother could drive. He was gone. 
the, but the rest of us couldn't. So we couldn't do anything unless the school bus took us there or my mother drove us. So that, those two experiences growing up in a place where I was independent as a young kid, could do whatever I wanted, and had lots of friends to do it with, to, to a place where I was totally dependent on my parents, and etc. You know, it, it was quite a shock with me. So that's today what I'm talking to you about, and this discussion you are having today, is what are the kinds of places that we want to call home, and what strategies and tools do we need to create those conditions so we can create those wonderful places that allows us and our children to flourish. Because that's what this is about. It's not about concrete, it's not about bricks and mortar. It's about how do our people flourish. And so, so I'm going to tell you a little about, a bit about what we've learned in the Portland area. And it's about how do you achieve the outcomes that people want. What does it mean to flourish? One is that everybody wants to be able to provide for their family. So economic security, access to jobs is critical. And opportunities are critical. Education is a part of that as well. So everyone has the opportunity to support their family. We want places where our kids can be safe. Very critical. That's a major issue that everyone cares about. Can our, are our kids safe? And are they healthy? And that means we want clean air, clean water. We want places where the kids can go play and be active. We also want them to be independent. You know, we have our fears about our kids, but we also want them to grow up and get the hell out of the house too, right? How many people have kids back at home again after they've gone up to school? <laughs> they come back, you know, the boomerang generation. But we do want them to get out there eventually. The more independent they are as younger kids, the more opportunity they have to expand in their lives and grow in their lives. We also want places that support strong ties between citizens and residents of the community. There's the formal stuff, citizen participation, the parent-teacher association, etc. But also, how about a place where you just bump into people? the Starbucks of the world, or the local coffee shop that sells organic, locally grown coffee. You go local coffee here, right? Yeah, it's in your cup. Yeah, it's in the cup. Okay, great. <laughs> no, so that kind of informal interaction of people that enriches our lives is really important to us. I mentioned healthy, and then also we want to be able to brag about our home, right? When your relatives come to visit, where do you take them? I don't think you take them out to Hobby 101 and say, let's go to the third McDonald's on the left. I love it. No, you want to take them downtown and walk them around the waterfront and show them the port and show them the beautiful buildings of the state capitol as well. You want to be proud of your home. So the question is, is there a formula and what can you learn? And it turns out there are a lot of things we can learn from other places. But I want to step back just a little bit and talk a bit about, because the question here is about sprawl versus density. And the issue is, I think, that simplifies it and makes it more about, again, uh, the physical world versus the uh, spiritual, emotional world that we all live in and want to uh, prosper in. But we do have a lot of history here in the last 50 years of promoting a certain style of life, which is the single family home in a large lot out someplace that's very sylvan. But what, has that really worked? And I think we want to be pretty clear eyed about that and look at the, the data that shows uh, is that a good lifestyle? Does it meet those values of economic prosperity, safety, health? security. And I think what I, I, we have found is that it doesn't. You know, we do have our personal park, you know, a big lot, but if you're like me, you get tired of mowing after a while. I've actually dug up all my grass and planted with other stuff. We do have the freedom to, you know, paint our house whatever color we want, unless you have a homeowner agreement that doesn't allow you to do that. You also have mobility and convenience. Well, we did until everybody moved to the suburbs, and now the freeways are full, and you're stuck in traffic all the time. Quiet, peace and quiet, except at 7 a.m. when the leaf blowers and the lawnmowers start up on Saturday morning. Economic boom. Well, I think we have a lesson here that actually the farther away housing is located, the more it dropped in value in the last economic crash. And it did the same thing in the 2000 crash, the 1990 crash, the 1982 crash. Convenience and accessibility are build value. And, and keep value over time. And so, how did this come about? And I'll just the, the shortest history lesson is that it was really the revolution in transportation that all of a sudden we had a cheap, easy way to get go long distances very easily. And that was the car, cheap gas. And then, of course, we subsidized that with uh, our highway programs that opened up lots of lands for redevelopment. And it kind of gave this vision that we, or this uh, illusion, I should say 
that there was all this great economic activity, but a lot of it was just uh, people building houses for the next people who would build houses for the next people. Uh, Las Vegas syndrome here. And then, how about the safety issue? Uh, here's some key things to me, because I, I have been a teacher, I have two kids, very concerned about this. Actually, Sightline Institute, based on Seattle, has said that the number one cause of, that the biggest threat to young, especially adolescent males, is the automobile. It is actually more dangerous for a kid to grow up in the suburbs because of how much time they spend in the car and how dangerous it is to be in a car than it is to grow up in inner city neighborhoods. It, this is uh, you know, statistically shown that. And it's also the number one cause, preventable cause of death for people ages two to 34 is car crashes. And so there, just the more time you spend in the car, the more dangerous it is. We also get isolated. A lot of sociological studies show that if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have sidewalks, where the, high, the traffic is high speed, you know fewer and fewer of your neighbors. And that the more, the slower the speed of the streets, the more sidewalks, the more, the stronger your social networks are and the connectivity. And as a kid, you know this. If you can't walk to your friend's house, you don't see them except during your formal time at soccer practice and at school. And that isolation, I think, unfortunately, plays out in the political world because we don't know the people that we're arguing with. We have a harder time seeing their point of view and understanding that they see life in a little different way because they live it in a little different way. But when you're always interacting with them, you have an opportunity then to understand where they're coming from. The health issue, especially now, we're seeing huge increases in childhood obesity. Diabetes is now a childhood disease. 20 years ago, diabetes was an adult onset disease. Pretty shocking, but 30% of our children are overweight. And so what does that mean? Huge health care costs in the future, limitations on their own lifestyle and their ability to earn a living. And then the economic piece I mentioned a bit, you know, the boom and bust about the economic. And our standard of living actually has declined in the last 40 years, not just because of urban development, other issues there as well. But now it's, it's necessary for most families to have two earners in order to maintain their standard of living. And one of those reasons is that the cost of transportation has gone from about 4% in the early 1900s before the car to about 20% of the average family's income now goes to transportation. Maintaining and operating two or more vehicles, mainly. And lower income families can spend more on transportation than they do on their homes. You know, think about it. more on transportation in homes. Homes are supposed to be your biggest expense in life, right? But people are spending an average of 50% of their income just on transportation and their housing costs alone. So is it an affordable location? It's not just about the house, it's how much you have to drive. And we're finding more and more low income people are driving to qualify. So they live out in the country, and their quality of life is actually not any higher, but they can't afford housing in the city because we don't look at the cost of transportation when we look at their cost of living and what they can afford. And so that affects them. And then they get displaced, too, as urban living becomes more exciting again, and people want to live in urban areas, but we're not producing enough housing there. People get displaced or low income. They have to move farther and farther out. We see this in Portland. That's actually, I think, our biggest failure in the Portland region is that the inner city now is a great place to live. Well, the housing prices, my neighborhood, you could buy a house for 5,000 bucks in 1980. It was being abandoned. I overpaid, I paid 50,000 for mine. But now those houses are going for an average of half a million dollars. And rents are skyrocketing. And so lower income people are being displaced away from jobs, away from access to education. And we're seeing the social problems going in areas, the suburbs, where they don't have the social infrastructure to, to deal with it. And our gang problems are now in the suburbs, not in the city. And that's our failure in Portland. It's not enough housing that, so you can maintain a good affordable housing supply. So uh, that's kind of the ouch part of this thing, right? Okay, so that revolution, like many revolutions, uh, that promises to change our life for the better didn't work out as well as we thought. So that's why I think people use the word sprawl in this uh, derisive, dismissive way that it's a negative thing. But again, it's about, we created that though. And that's all we have to remember, is that we created sprawl on purpose. We developed zoning regulations to separate work from housing based on the old days when you had big industry, you didn't want to live next to it, it was unhealthy. We did things like requiring minimum parking amounts everywhere, which makes it so that very expensive to build in urban areas if you have to build structured parking, twenty to $40,000 a space. And so why build there? You can't make any money, move out farther. 
lots of our zoning regulations and building codes are actually anti-urban. They actually encourage moving out. Most of our cities actually would not be built today under current zoning regulations. You don't have the space around each building to move a fire truck, which is the current regulation in most areas. So you can get access there. Even if you have a sprinkler system, you don't need fire trucks very often, right? We also hide the upfront costs of building new infrastructure. We mix development fees and property taxes from existing businesses and property owners. We get subsidies from other governments. And so we can build a new school way out in the middle of nowhere because the costs are mostly covered, but we don't have a way to cover that ongoing cost of busing the kids there and the fact that kids can't walk anymore uh, in that, and it's not part of that neighborhood. So we have those, uh, you know, some of these problems are one of the reasons why the American Society of Engineers has given America's infrastructure a D minus rating. Because we're spending money on building new, because that's kind of the push and the uh, subsidies are for that, and we're not taking care of what we have already. So that's the negative side. Okay, now we're going to be happy, because I'm going to tell you about the, the positive part right here, and because I, I think there's so much that's going on here that we can take advantage of. One is uh, a researcher called, uh, named Chris Nelson from the University of, o of Utah. He looks at the trends in buildings and such over the future, and his estimation is that 50% of what we see outside when we go around our community will be replaced or redeveloped in the next 20 years because of growth and change that we have an opportunity to see a major change there in one generation. And in two generations, almost everything that we see in our community will be new or, re or been repurposed, replaced, rebuilt, remodeled. So there's an opportunity here just to the natural cycle things that we don't notice because we live in the moment, right? We have short lifespans. An example is uh, one of our suburbs, Gresham, on the west side, east side of the town. 40 years ago, it had 4,000 people. It was a little cow town. Little, it serviced the dairy and farms around the area. Today, it has 120,000 people, 40 years later. And people living there today assume it's always looked like this. But you know, 40 years ago, it was this little tiny town. And it was separated from the city of Portland by miles of dairy farms. And now they're grown together, and it's very big. So. How do we shape that growth, right? If it's going to change, we need to be in charge of that and figure out how that we want it to grow. So I have a few strategies, and that's what I'm going to wrap up on. Here's some strategies that work. One is listen to the people and give them what they want. And here's a, uh, they may not know they want it yet, though. Here's the trick. <laughs> a suburb of Portland, about uh, 8,000, 10,000 people, I think, is what live there now. It's called Tiger. It's at the intersection of two major roads. It's basically single-family residential with a commercial area, which has a lot of employees come. They commute there. And so the, when you, we went and, and spoke with the people about their change that's coming to the community and what do they want to see there, they said, we love it just like it is, but there's too many commuters, and we need a Trader Joe's. <laughs> Everyone wants a Trader Joe's, right? Uh, and so they said, uh, well, we talked to Trader Joe's, and Trader Joe's said, we will not locate a store unless there's 3,000 people within a mile of the store. We did the analysis of Tiger zoning, and it said, well, you only have zoning for 1,000 there. There's you know, five, 600 people living there now, but you only have zoning for 1,000. If you want a store, what are you gonna do? And so they sat down as a community through a planning process and said, well, we can rezone this area along Main Street for four-story buildings. And we've got a multifamily there. We take a bit of the commercial area, and change it to mixed use so they could be residential and commercial. And voila, they had 3,000 zoning for 3,000 people there. And voila, they get Trader Joe's to come in. Plus, they get less commuting because a lot of people are commuting there because they couldn't afford a house in that neighborhood because all they have is three bedroom, two bath, a single family subdivisions. And now they had condominiums, they had uh, townhouses, they had apartments. And so the commuting problem actually reduced. And now that community is one of the biggest proponents for bringing light rail to their downtown, which uh, if you follow light rail politics, light rail politics can get kind of wild. It's uh, the Tea Party resurgent over transit, which is kind of a crazy thing, but that community wants it because they know they can get even higher numbers of people living close by and less traffic on their streets without changing the single family neighborhoods that they really care about. Because there's plenty of land along those commercial corridors to rezone for this. Not only that, their property values go up after uh -huh. they come to them. Yes. Yes, after you get Trader Joe's and Starbucks and all this kind of stuff, property light values jump. And Light Rail does it as well. So the other second one, uh, stop fighting the market and stop subsidizing losers. 
As I mentioned, much of our zoning regulations were developed to address threats that no longer exist. We have rules that separate industry from housing, prohibit unsafe housing like tenements. Okay, tenements, 1910, tenements were a problem in New York. Multifamily housing today does not have the same health and safety problems that tenements did, okay? It's a great place to live. We separate houses and jobs, require parking, I said these things, large lot sizes, we overzone for single family. We take this multifamily zoning that we do have and stick it way off in the corner someplace or put affordable housing in the swamp because no one wants that land and it's the only place that nonprofit developers, developers can afford, right? But you know, where they belong is where it's accessible, where it's close by, and, and helps provide people, customers, and activity. So, and the other part is, is that the poor housing developers, they don't really have a choice either because the rules that, we, that govern multifamily, especially mixed-use development, where you have retail and housing together, are so complex and financing is so difficult that they just say, forget it, I'll just go out and do a subdivision. And so what we're doing is saying, you know, go out and do these things that we don't really want because we're going to make it hard as hell to do the things that we say we want. So changing those rules to make it simpler and easier to do those kind of developments are a key thing that you can do. The other one is, what is your future market? And with Olympia, and I told Chris I had a secret here for you, you probably know this one already, but what is, a, you know, the most stable economic activity, stable industry in America? Government, okay. How old is the average state government worker? <laughs> it looks like me, okay. You know, it's like, I think it's 52 in, in Washington. The average state government worker is 52, okay. What are they going to do soon? Retire, okay. So you got two markets there. One is the retirees. And what do retirees want in America today? They want to live someplace that's accessible, vital, exciting, good restaurants. I mean, they, they're going to retire with their herds account, right? They want to go out to dinner every night, right? So where are they going to be? And who's replacing them? You know, it's a 20 and 30-somethings who also, when you look at the trends of millennials, they want to live in urban areas. They're giving up their cars. They want to have, they want to come out, well, I don't know, state office workers come out at 5 o'clock and go get a tattoo. That's the software people. Right? <laughs> and that's true. There's a software developer com development company in downtown Portland located in this, in this high rise. And it's like, well, why are you there and not out with Nike and Intel and all that? He says, and the person says, when my workers come off work at 10, 12 o'clock at night, they want to go to the vegan strip club and get a tattoo. They don't want to get to a parking lot and drive 10 miles home. <laughs> so you have this huge opportunity with that changeover 